the timing would work out and Rabbi Orlowit would come and we'd be able to really have a closure to those who attended the Chinuch, to the Chinuch of Adam. We're able, we'd be able to really have our questions addressed, our, our, um, our points clarified, but that never, that never was able to materialize and happen. And I'm very, very happy that <coughs> after our hard work of the Chinovad and those who came consistently and those who even weren't able to come up to all of them, but to most of them, were able to were able to really internalize a lot of the a lot of the very, very important messages that I gave over based on Rabbi Orlovich's words. So we have a great, great opportunity. I mean, uh, it's 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 very. Uh, it's a very emotional thing for me to present my own Rebbe. Rabbi Orlowick has given me a lot, a lot of guidance in my life. I wouldn't be wherever I am today with, <laughs> if, it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't for all of the tremendous, tremendous guidance I got from Rabbi Orlowick throughout my life. And it's a very, very great honor to ask him to, uh, to give us uh, the uh, words of wisdom on the subject that we were working on, which is, of course, based on a lot of the hard work that he put together on this subject. So what time are we speaking? I think we're going to until eight till nine thirty, and then questions till nine forty-five. Yes, sir. My wife is not here, so I have to have somebody to take orders from. <laughs> okay, so that we shall do. We know that. <coughs> I received a letter before I left the United States a few hours ago from a student of mine. Um, I'm not going to read you the entire letter or even a large part of it. Um, this person um, doesn't know where he is and where he's going and why he should want to go anywhere. But I want to read you one line, and that would be the beginning of a subject that I think I want to... I think that needs to be addressed. If Rebbe has any advice, please feel free to call any time. I've made peace that I'll never be close to some of the people I love. You should never get such a letter from your child. I've made peace that I'll never be close to some of the people I love. Done. You can't. It's not going to work. Not my son. So, the subject is how to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. As much as we can make sure of anything, we can't be sure of anything. Okay? We can't be sure of anything. <clears throat> There's a very big rule in life that you do the best you can and then you stop. Because uh, to have to do better than the best you can is a formula for insanity. You have to stop. Sometimes you have to stop. Sometimes you have to stop in order to, to continue. I was asked to speak uh, down south. I don't know which day it was. I came Tuesday morning and I lost track of time. But Tuesday morning wasn't that long ago. So they asked me to speak to the Bachrim about the break. <coughs> that's coming up, the big winter break. And um, I said a break is, there's, one, there's two types of breaks. There's a break where I need to get away from what I'm doing because I can't handle it anymore, so I, need to, I just need to, like, need to chill out, uh, I need to get away. And then, when I come back, okay, like, you know, same old world. It's like, you know, you go to a movie, it's bright, it's light, it's beautiful. And then you leave the movie house and people still go to movies. I don't go to movies anymore. And it's the same old street. So what's the, what's the solution for that? Another movie. That's one kind of break. And the other kind of break is I want to continue what I'm doing. And in order to continue what I'm doing, I have to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, the heart, I don't know if there's any doctors here, but the heart rests a lot of its life. It stops beating, not for very long, okay? But it starts. That stop, but to stop in order to start. 
It's like, how do I measure whether an emotion is good or not? Well, what does it bring? Is guilt good or is guilt not good? You know, like, you know my definition of a good question is that both sides of the question are right. The question is which side is more right? Well, so the answer to every good question begins with, it depends. So is guilt good or not? Well, it depends what it produces. If guilt produces paralysis, it's no good. If guilt produces truva, an action, now I could do something about it because I feel guilt, please feel guilty. So when you finish the break, so then how do you feel? Oh gosh, it's Monday morning. Or do you feel now I can get back into things? I never really left. The break wasn't a break, it was a different type of continuation. I want to keep going, I like my life. I just I need to stop now. It's like people need to go to sleep. I have a treadmill. Treadmill is very important to me. Yeah. And I use it several times a week. Sometimes uh, there's a treadmill called the Jerusalem Streets. It's also a treadmill. It's, you know, variated inclines. Yeah? If not, to walk up an incline. Sometimes you have a regular treadmill. Treadmills are boring. So, how do I make sure I continue using the treadmill? Mozart. I brought Mozart with me in the uh, my pet travel bag. I have a singular pleasure now of walking out of an airport without waiting for any luggage on the uh, carousel. It's a tremendous feeling. Of course, I might have to have my frock pressed before Shabbos, but it's worth it. So a lot of things, it depends. Is life good or is life not good? To this person, life is clearly not good. Why? Because when you have people in your life who you love, so you want to share your life with them. If you can't, then it's a great thing. So I want to talk about this subject a little bit. About like, what do you do? I'm not telling you, you know, just listen to me. I'll set you straight. Do what I say. And then you'll be fine. No such thing. There's no such thing. I'm going to give you guidelines. Will it be hard? There's a big rule I teach. I teach people in the yeshiva. If it's easy, it's not a reason to do it, and if it's hard, it's not a reason not to do it. The question is, should I be doing this or not? Whether it's hard or not is static. Okay? It's static. Whether is it hard or not? That's a very uh, a decadent concept. Is this going to be hard? Are you supposed to do it or are you not supposed to do it? So, <coughs> what I'm telling you, I'm telling you it's going to be hard. But hard has two definitions. One definition of hard is hard, such as picking up heavy weights. Another definition, definition of hard is it takes a long time. There are things that take a long time. take a long time. Now, I'm, I, I, tonight I'm not going to speak about how to do things that take a long time, even though that's a very good subject, because most things that are worth doing take a long time, because I want to focus on this particular thing, which takes a long time, okay? But again, I'm not giving you a prescription for every cross T and dotted I. You have to use your brains. I'm just giving you uh, some direction. So let's start at the beginning. The beginning is the first day of life. Actually, it's not. It's before the first day of what we call life. <clears throat> An embryo also is a person. Okay. I have this uh, 
personal theory of why there's so much ADD today. Yeah? Uh, one reason is they now have the tools to diagnose it. So what was before was you're stupid or you're lazy or this. Well, no, there's a neurological condition. Yeah? And do um, such a thing as an ADD brain. Yeah? Whether you should take medicine or do other things, not our subject. Yeah? There'll be a question and answer period, but we have to stand to. Un un but I have another reason why it isn't. I own my own personal pet reason why. You know, I have the three ways to tell whether you're young or old. One is you enjoy making shidduchim. Making shidduchim is a very big mitzvah. But it's achrayu. I just decided to use the, my imitation of the Sephardic pronunciation of things, because I remember of Miller Zechein Leroch, he started giving his famous shiurim, but with Mr. Bo, was being recorded by Mr. Shelby, and says, out of deference to the shul where he's speaking, he's going to use the Sephardic pronunciations of, but don't laugh at me too hard, okay? It's a big achrayu to, uh, to make shiruchim. It's fun, you're still young. The second is, do you enjoy driving? <clears throat> if you enjoy driving, then you're still young. If driving is just a very dangerous way of going from one place to another, so then, um, but you have to do it, then you're, then you're mature. You know, uh, there was a great Jew named Rabbi Kiva Eger. Kiveg is a Chanavach and me have one thing in common. We don't call people Talmudim. Okay? People close to me. My, my Talmud. We're my Talmud. Yeah? But you can't call yourself my Talmud if you will talk on a cell phone while you're driving. You just can't. Even if you have your hands free, it doesn't make much of a difference as far as the, the um, distraction. And it, you have the same level of attention like a guy who's legally drunk and can't drive. Okay, that's a message from your creator. If you get into an accident while you're talking on a cell phone, you can't say it's been a shaman. It's not. Rabbi Miller said very clearly, don't blame God for your stupidity. Okay? So, if you enjoy driving, you're still young. The third is, do you consider today's Jewish music music? To me, it's pure rock and roll. Okay? There's a wonderful Jew in Detroit who says, how do you tell the difference between good music and bad music? Good music, is shalash. From shalash to adult. like that. Bad music is like that. Yeah? Go to any Jewish wedding, and they play <coughs> Hasidic music. Yeah? It's, it's my, it's, to me, it sounds like a disco. Yeah? Sometimes it doesn't match the words at all, and it's a profanity of the words. Sometimes it's not. But it's all it's rock and roll. So this kid is listening in, in, in embryo to Jewish music. And they have shown, there was this, uh, there's this book, Revelations, by Dan Roth. Someone lent it to me. He said, you know, I leaf through it. They did a study. Someone had money for this. They had women reading to their stomachs. Um, Dr. Spock, cat in a hat. And then after birth, they hooked these kids up to some sucking device based on how hard and how often they sucked the thing so that we could, they would listen to something. Guess what they picked? Cat in a hat and their mother's voice. They remembered it. So I think the mother's around the kitchen and she's rocking and rolling and she's listening to Kaylee, Kaylee, Loma, Loma, Zaftoni, Kaylee. Yeah, it's pure rock and roll. So this kid is coming out, at, you know, when he's born, he's coming out rocking and rolling. Because that's how he was programmed. So someone asked me, a Shaila, but what if my wife likes that kind of music? Let her listen to it. Okay? But life begins right at the beginning. And it's true in our subject also. In the early 1900s, there was a fondling home that the mortality rate was higher than the average. 
And they couldn't understand why. The kids are being fed on time, diapered, uh, the hygiene was good, the nutrition was good. Why are, they, why are they dying? And they hired an elderly, loving nurse to pick the children up, to stroke them, to hold them lovingly. And the mortality rate went down. This is one of my personal proofs that a human being has a soul. Because if you're just a body, like, what's the difference? I'm clean and I'm fed. Why, why should I be dying? Is that a scientific reason? No. But to me, it's like, it's, that's what it says. So we see kids from the earliest of life are, are in tune to their in tune to their surroundings. There's a fellow named um, John Goddard. I think that's his name. John Gottman. Yeah. I'm, I see I'm sounding like this well-read. I, I don't read the, I, I really don't look at these things. Yeah? I never read John Gottman's book. And uh, yeah, it's just, people show me things, or I, look, I, I see things sometimes in places where I can't learn. Yeah? The only time I sat down to actually read a book on psychology was since I'm a mashgirich in the yeshiva, so I deal with sleeplessness, insomnia, so I asked Mary Tavar from Hamilton, Ontario, if people know what that means. You know what Hamilton is, yeah? So I asked Mary Tavar, like, you know, okay, I need a book on sleep. Yeah? So she mailed me this book, uh, No More Sleepless Nights. This lady's amazing. It's an amazing lady. So anyway, but I will say, I've never sat down to read this stuff. I'm not against it, just not. So John Gottman is, an, is, a, is a world expert on marriage. And he says that kids in the crib can sense whether the Shalom Vais in it. In the crib. Gosh. And that, and that infants don't nurse as well from mothers who don't want them. I mean, this kid is like three days old. Kids feel things. That's why I don't believe, as Mary Dvorak told me, don't let kids cry it out until 11 months of age for more than 90 seconds. If you need to, you can have an early breakdown. Say this guy, um, Ferber, wrote a book, How to Solve Your Child's Sleep Problems, that you could have, um, you could start letting the kids start to cry it out at five months, but he's being sued now, and he, a class action suit, of course, is uh, south of the border where it's the minute to sue. And, um, and he has retracted. As we can't get now, shucks and edits it. It's like buying a second revised parenting book. Like who got the first unrevised edition? Yeah? You see? We don't let kids cry it out. Well, it works. Kids start to sleep through the night. But like heroin also works. A lot of things work. Yeah? But the point is that that's not our subject either. Yeah? So I'm just showing you through our path that this touches a lot of subjects. So, kids are affected by what called, if they're not listened to, they stop talking. Kids stop crying in fondling <coughs> homes. Kids don't cry, you know why? Because it doesn't help. And that's our subject. Why should a boy say, I can't share my life with my parents? Now this, per this, this person loves his parents, and his parents are wonderful people. My dad truly believed his way of upbringing was the happiest, which is why I don't blame him. But what will I answer my kid when he asks me if this is truly the life I believe was best for him, being a uh, Torah Jew? And I'll know I was too afraid to give him the life I truly thought he'd be happy in. How can I make my child go through life thinking he'd be happy to live another life? Is the alternative not to marry and don't have children? How, do you know how old this person is? I do. I saw him today. He's uh, 20. No. No, 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 no. He's, uh, I started knowing when he was 20. He told me in the letter how old he is. No, he's not that old. I, I know I know that's a relative statement, not that old. Okay? Um, <coughs> I met a woman last night in Springfield, Massachusetts. A one young woman vibrant woman, full of energy and life and youth. And she's 86. Yeah? He's, uh, I think this boy's 26. Something like that. 
He says it here somewhere. Verse 26. 20. It is 20. So he's afraid of mellowing out. Because well, mellowing out is selling out. Understand? He's afraid. I, I, I'm not, there's more parts to this, but I, I want to just on, sub, on the subject. So he loves his father. His father meant what was best to him. And I know the father. Father had no clue about where this kid is. Not a clue. Very meaning, very well-meaning person, but no clue. And why do they have no clue? First of all, sometimes it's genetic. People have there are people who don't have clue. Yeah, it just happens. Yeah. But a better reason is because the kid didn't tell him. And then the question is why? And this is our subject: how to avoid it. Because you, I have never seen a closed one-year-old, except in family home. Which not, none of you are, you're, that's not the deal here. It doesn't pertain. People who are not heard stop talking. Whether you are an infant of three months and your crying doesn't help, so you stop talking, or you are an old person and, pe and people are not listening to you, so you also stop talking. It's painful to talk and not be heard. And people, healthy people, don't do things that hurt. Not consistently. We have a, a term for that called a masochist. Healthy people stop doing things that are painful. So the subject is how to keep that child convinced that you really want to know what he or she is. That's the subject. So this will never happen. It'll never happen to you. That I can never share my life with my uncle, my dad. That will never happen to me. Hopefully. And so what are the moving parts of, of encouraging a person to communicate? There was a story, and I think this happened before the last time I came to Toronto. Thanks to the Krona, I come here once a year. Um, at the board of a, a see, he sees on my passport that I'm a good boy. I come every January, more or less, and I leave. So I'm getting less and less trouble. But he scans my passport and said, oh, you here? Yeah, it's, things aren't as good down, down south as they are up here, are they? So I said, no, I don't get good down south also, but it's good here too. And then I tell them my finish at the border, which they always like, that how do I know that Thornhill is northern Toronto? Because Thorn and North is the same letters. I never met anybody from Toronto that realized that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a stranger from afar notices things that you don't. Yeah? So, <clears throat> people stop talking if they're not heard. So the story I would say was like this. A woman asked me a question. She says, my son, he's tall, I guess he's about six. He says to me, my mommy, I'm furious at you. I hate you. I feel like chopping you up and putting you in the oven. It happened. So what should she say? So the answer is, I believe, she should tell her child, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm sure Grace told me. Not for self-defense reasons. For two reasons. One is the kid is weaker than her. And the other is in two minutes you can come up for a hug anyway. You understand? So like, there's no real danger. That moment, you plug him into a lie detector, he's telling you the truth. He does want to chop her up. Because he did not get his fifth help with the dessert. And that's infuriating. He likes the ice cream. What is this? Yeah. I've mentioned before in Toronto that in London, the kids called the police for child abuse because they, they didn't get their fifth health and dessert. It was a Jerusalem Post. Yeah. 
So the police came, and at least then they hadn't arrested, didn't arrest anybody. Today, you never know. What's called abuse. So you tell the child sincerely, and sincerely is an important word, because kids have very good antennas. They have even better antennas than women do. And women have very good antennas. It's the men that are learning to say that. I used to tell my seminary students, not all men are evil, but they're all learning to say that. And you have to train them to be patient with them. So, kids can sense. If you're not sincere, then don't start. Don't, have, don't be insincere with kids. So, what, a tr what that person says to you is important to you. Right? You want to be happy that they're talking to you. The worst diseases are the ones that don't talk to you. There's no pain. The Hashem should protect us from those diseases. I want you to talk to It doesn't mean as soon as you give a little uh, sign, a little tips, you have to drop everything and listen to him. No. Because he has to know that you have rights also. And you're a person also. And he can't have your ear every single second whenever he wants. For his benefit, not for your benefit. But there has to come a time when he's heard. It has to be part of your day. And there are certain elements to this which I want to talk about. First of all, it has to happen. I remember as I think that was the sixth grade. Which is uh, before anybody here in this room was alive. Yeah? I think. I think. Okay. It's well, it's mm, about 53 years ago. So maybe not. Maybe there are some people who are older than that. I was in fifth grade about 53 years ago, 54 years ago. And uh, we used to ask a question sometimes. And then we say, you know, it's a good question, I'll look it up. You never did. You never came back for anything. When I taught elementary school, so kids would raise their hands and you know be anxious to ask a question. Oh, okay. First of all, I can't remember who put up his hand first. I guess it's too hard for me. But I will answer your questions, but not right now. But they knew the time was going to come, so they they accepted it. But if the time didn't come, then it's like the example I always give. If there's uh, 500 people in an institution and they know in the dining room there's only 499 portions they're going to be pushing. Because no one wants to be left out. So the first element is it has to happen. It is very, very important. On the plane here I prepared a talk because I found out two days ago that at the convention next Shabbos I have to talk about <coughs> The convention is about sensitivity between kids, how to promote that in the school. So I'm going to talk to them. I hope Rabbi Cohen will have the technology to me to print it out. Because say, you know, I don't have my printer here. And my computer teacher will not let anybody put anything into my computer. Zero. And since I don't have internet and I don't have email, my, my computer is impregnable. Yeah, as long as nobody puts their USB key into my computer, ever, nothing. Yeah, don't even a formatted one, nothing. It's pure paranoia. Yeah, because like you say in South Africa, and that computer is my life. Mm -hmm. That's my life. Yeah, <coughs> it's all there. It's very humbling. That my, that uh, 25 years of thought is in that little thing, but that's my life. So anyway. It has to happen. It has to happen in the right surroundings. It has to be quiet. It has to be uh, privacy, uh, privacy. I don't know how to say. See here, privacy, right? Yeah. You're under the influence of down south. Yeah? It has to happen, it has to happen in a, in a time that is clear non-verbally to this person that, that you are listening. That is important. If a person is a genius, he can do several things at one time while they're listening to someone, don't do it. Let's say you're a therapist. 
And someone's talking to you, and you're, you can, you can, you know, read a book and take calls while they're talking and spit everything back to them what they told you. Don't do it, because there's a, an emotional component of respect that I'm giving you my full attention. So there should be no, no, uh, no. This should be a quiet place. It should be important enough to you that that child knows it's important to you. It matters. And that's, by the way, the things that we say, if something is true, it's more likely to be true in more than one place. It's true with adults also. I know someone who, connection to his father, here is child's father. And um, this man has one consuming interest in life, Southeastern collegiate basketball. Southeastern means uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi. I don't know if these, these words mean anything to you, but it's uh, that's south of the south of the south of the border. Yeah, that's what the father says. He follows the team, this collegiate basketball team from his city. He follows them around the southeast, every basketball, and. His wife is loyal to him, so she won't come visit her, children, her grandchildren in Jerusalem because dad's on the road, and I go with him. She cares about basketball. Yeah? This boy has to be up on Savannah and Atlanta and uh, Baton Rouge, you know, New Orleans, how they're doing. He has to know. He should know. Because that's what Abba likes to talk about, is respect. And if you want to talk about things that you don't think are important, that's too bad. It's important. The example I always give, if you're going somewhere with your child, don't be in a hurry. Not, and he's, he's going on the sidewalk or the pavement, <coughs> and, uh, and there's, there's some ants marching across the uh, sidewalk. They call it the sidewalk here, or a pavement, sidewalk. Yeah? <coughs> Now, I had this traumatic experience in Melbourne when I said I was on a trip, and then someone says to me, the trip is when you fall down the stairs, we call it an excursion. You know, sometimes. The worst was when uh, I was in London, and they drive on the wrong side of the road over there. They're very courteous, but they drive on the wrong side. And after another brush with death, so I, I uh, told the person who was, uh, who was with me, I told them, can you please cross me? And in England, cross me means something else. It means what the minister does for you on Sunday morning, which is an rabbinic request. <laughs> Can you cross me? Rabbi, you want me to cross you? <laughs> okay, so it was like there was some very some misunderstandings over there. I have a few more, but it was not the time for that now. But the point is that if he's getting some watch me across the sidewalk, and the kid wants to stop, and he's interested. And by the way, it is interesting. These ants are very interesting. I have two rabbis here who know halacha very well. I have a halacha conundrum. Is do I make a bracha achrena now? Or, because if I wait much longer, I'm going to get thirsty again, if it's ozalei hanasei. Or, no, that's the derech, to drink and get thirsty and drink. So, Rabbi, you're the more here? Huh? Rabbi Mutcha. I discussed it with a very chash of a rabbi in... Uh, so, then I'm going to have to pass it, right? Baruch atah bin alochin amalchah lamboin afoshis rabbis. I'm going to get thirsty in a few seconds. It's going to be gone. If you disagree, you tell me. I'll, I will move up with us. Thank you. 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 you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's so interesting. And when you sit down with a kid on the floor and you talk about this and talk about that, that's building your kid's self-esteem. Because now, oh, I think about things in my manner. 
does it matter to have also? And it does matter, because that's where he is. Because if you tell that kid what's important to you really is not important, so I can guarantee you that that child will one day tell you, Abba, Dad, Mi Padre, whatever yeah, language he uses, what's important to you is not important to me. Okay, uh, we're done. I have another five minutes. So that's the, that's the mm -hmm. next thing. Is you should take your time to give him the kabod to find a space where you can listen to him. The second is, you should really be interested in what they have to say. Thirdly, you should remember what they say. If you have a poor memory, it's not a problem. Write it down. And one of these things, yeah, one of these things, is a Jew named Label Sharfman. Label Sharfman, I used to have at these, at these organizers, electronically, said, right away, all the way. <laughs> you know, you'll see one day you're going to go back to this. And he was right. At this world of Shaduchim, you have this, these sleek organizers. They're beautiful. They're, they're real intelligent. They're gorgeous. They have bad meters. You look at them cross-eyed once, then they uh, Data has been impaired. You know, press delete to erase all data, and then we'll start over again. And I did it. It's like the Palestinians. I did everything they wanted, and it still didn't help. You drop it once, they will never talk to you again. So I have bad meters. This thing is it's ugly. It's stupid, but you know. And he still talks to me. Yeah? So, you know something? If you have a bad memory, it's not a problem. Write it down! This will go through the wash. And you know, my son may not be able to read it. Depending if there was bleach in it and the water was too hot. Yeah? <coughs> Remember what they said. The more details, the better. It's a non-verbal message you matter to me. Non-verbal messages are the most important ones. Because those are the ones that I don't have to convince you. I'm right. You need to convince yourself. I didn't tell you anything. Except where people are. I am not a liberal in the sense that everybody's okay. Not everybody's okay. I can respect everybody. I can love everybody. To say it's okay, there are things that are not okay. But I can accept that this where a person is. When that kid wants to cut his mother up and put her in the oven, it's not okay. It's illegal. Okay? It's a violation of her her rights. Okay, as an American. <coughs> okay? It's not a, she has a right to live. Accept who people are. I must, and I missed the point I'm going to end with because I have three minutes. <clears throat> people have to feel safe. They need to feel safe. They can feel it, they can speak, they can talk. And then they will. I'll give you a, a, very, a very poignant example. When a, a one and a half year old falls <coughs> and starts to scream, so you need a microscope to find where the wound is. So what does the mother do? She very sincerely says, Oi! Oh! And she gives her a little kiss and it's all better. <coughs> Why doesn't she say, Come on now, it's nothing! But a ten year old, an eight year old, the kid falls down, Come on now, it's nothing. You see, it's nothing. Don't do that. It's not nothing. It's not nothing. To that kid, it's something. One day he'll grow up and realize that that's nothing. But uh, right now, that's what he is. That's the, the famous mice with the girl Sadek, who uh, they caught and they, they, uh, they, con they condemned him to, to be burned at the stake. And the person who was uh, was going to light the fire said to him, "You're going to you're going to curse me for this. You're going to be your spirit will take vengeance on me." So uh, Tan Pataki said to him, "I'll tell you a story. There were there were kids. <coughs> Two kids were playing. One was the king's son, and the other was I guess some nobleman or something. And they were playing, and the, and the nobleman broke 
the toy soldiers of the king, of the king's son. What's this eight-year-old, seven-year-old? So when this man finally became king, so this person came to him and threw himself at his feet and said, Lord, forgive me! What I did to you when we were seven years old, when I was... So keep laughing at him. We were kids, he was toy soldiers, it was nothing. So that's what he said to this guy, you, you're doing me a favor. He said, this is a big deal, it's not a big deal. You're doing me a big favor. We don't look for that favor. I'm not going to be angry at you when I cross over to the other world. Kids grow up, but right now it's important to them. Kid wants the fifth helping you deserve. And it's not good for him. So what do you do? You make a nichum aveli. You comfort the mourner. You hold him, say, Shefala, I know. Problem is, Father, we surely don't say Shefala. Haseh katan Yeah. 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 He said to me, no, I'm really thrilled here. You know, she's talking. Don't get talking. Yeah, I'm bad man. Yeah, bad man. The guy said, this is good. And I, and, and I appreciate that you like it. We just did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I tell you, you know, in Morocco, 100 years ago, when there was still a healthy world, he actually his father hit his kid. The kid was expected to kiss his father's hand. 100 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that was a place. That's the minig- that was the minig- in Morocco then. You had to kiss your father. Maybe you don't want to throw it at the minig- then. Yeah? They had to kiss his father's hand. That was that was a healthy world. This today don't try it. <laughs> okay? So you come for the mourner. You understand, you're with him in his pain. But you can't have more ice cream. Two different things. But you hurt him. You purge him. You accept him. And you feel bad for him. And and then they don't keep talking to you. And this is what happened to him. That I can never share my life with my father. I'm sure keep that for some time. Okay. I'm a one minute and thirty seconds over. Any questions? Well, yes. Well, we have a lot of questions. What I, what I was thinking that would be most beneficial is, is certain points of clarification that we didn't have a chance to, <coughs> during the Vajra to, to discuss. I wanted to bring up some of them and so that we could address them. I'd like to start with the first one that I think that we didn't speak about so much, but how to address chutzpah nowadays by children. It's obviously a very big subject, but a certain... Even gu- it's in a dictionary now. Yeah. I know Canadian English, but in American English is the word chutzpah. Yeah, even even word Microsoft recognizes the word. Oh, yeah. 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 That's right. They say Microsoft or they spell with the H at the end or that name. <laughs> I saw that today on my computer on the plane coming to Toronto. First of all, Chuspa is not in the eyes of the beholder. It's in the eyes of the perpetrator. Does he mean it to be Chuspa? Is what matters, not how I take it. Hanka horn in Israel, it means nothing. The shortest amount of time it takes, a human being can measure the amount of time it takes for a light to about to change, and the Israeli driver is honking. So it's not a chutzpah. In London, what are you honking at? Honking? The horns don't work in London. It's not, it's not proper. So that's the first thing. Second is, why does he think he could be chutzpah to me? Is there anything about me that makes him feel like he be chutzpah? That you know, maybe the respect goes down. And thirdly, as my Rebbe Zechariah the Rocha said, if a kid's a chutzpah kid, it's he has a problem. I better help him with his problem now. Whose problem is it? Is it my problem? You got me upset. You are. Chuspidik, you are cheeky to me. That's English English. You are cheeky to me. To me? When you see me chuspidik to somebody else, it bothers you less. Yeah? He has a problem. 
In fact, we have to talk about bullying at this convention. Bullies, most, by the way, most of the research on bullying was done in Canada. I asked somebody in, uh, in LA, if you know who Shane Mendelson is, I know she, you know her? <coughs> Shane Mendelson. She's a librarian. She has a high degree in, in libra library science. So she's very close to me. So whenever I have to really study a subject, I just got to get all the stuff together. And she sends me, in a, you know, loosely hundreds of pages on the subject. Most of the research on bullying, it was done in Canada. You know, it was done in Canada. I don't know if I'm saying that's a big problem with bullying in Canada, but that's where it was done. Bullies, um, later on in life, a much higher percentage of them end up in jail. Because you hit the magic age of 18, or whatever the age is in, 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 in Canada is, and you continue behaving the way you behave, you were 17.364, so the reaction of the law enforcement is different in that 24 hours. But people don't turn over in 24 hours. So when you have a kid who's a bully, you better stop him now. Because or else, he's going to end up in big trouble when he gets older. So, uh, any negative behavior, you know, we just have a couple of minutes. Any negative behavior, you want to stop it, make sure it does not get what it wants. Whatever he wants, he can get it. Once he's a chuspedic, so he doesn't, then whatever he wanted from to get from that, he doesn't get it. Now, but you need to ask yourself, like, why did he do it to begin with? I, it, it must have started from something. It's like temper tantrums. Like, where did temper tantrums start? <coughs> so it, initially, the kid, I told you, you listen to Mary Dvar, you let the, you always service the kids crying. I guarantee you, the kid's going to be spoiled. Because that magic moment when the kid is crying out of distress, and now he's crying out of the, you better get here now, we can't have when that is. We, we, the human being can't catch that magic moment. It's like, you know, Ben Ashmosh is over there. The kid, now, yesterday, he was just in distress. Service him! And, uh, and when he becomes a tyrant. But after a couple of months, you can take a look at this kid, you see he's angry. That's the time to train him out. Your kid will be spoiled if, if, he, if, he, if he services crime. I guarantee you he'll be spoiled. It's okay, you spoil him out of it. You get him out of the spoiling when he's older, when he's over 11 months. Yeah? So, <clears throat> whatever he wanted to get from that chutzpah, he doesn't get it. <clears throat> and he'll get it. And the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be, and the longer it's going to take for this kid to get out of the chutzpah. But you, the, the, you must feel bad for him. It's like this mother, uh, the kid slipped on the stairs, and she told the kid, the young kid, Hit the stairs. Hit the stairs. So she's training this kid to always blame somebody. It's always someone else's fault. This principal told me that the kid blamed him for his problems. So the principal himself told me the story. And he said to him, good, I just came to see you. What about last year? I wasn't even here. So the kid gave this classic line. There's always somebody to blame. This kid will have a messed up life. Because there's always somebody to blame. It's never my fault. Understand? So you have to. So his chutzpah doesn't. It should get him nowhere. Eventually he'll stop. But the main thing is, you have to be a parent. But the kid would not think of being chutzpah. Like, well, I don't want to be to my father. Yeah. So the very first thing that you have to get off of is temper. It's anger. Why? Because anger is the face of a person minus the brains. Which is why I say the monkey house is the favorite place. One of the funniest places in the zoo is that what's a monkey? A monkey is the face of a person without the brains. It's funny. Unless you're in a pair for the anger, then you're afraid. You have to be a person that is deserving in that. Look, we're not going to do a perfect job. We're <coughs> standing there with no perfect jobs here. Okay? But um, more or less, if you're a person who's deserving of the respect, so that the chusp is not going to be so, uh, and not going to be so hot. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, the Rebbe was speaking uh, about uh, showing interest in what the child is interested in. Yes. Like say, for example, the ants you see on the streets. What, what, what if the child is interested in being a marsh, marsh kind of unimportant thing? Like the ants. Like the marsh video games and movies and things like that. To him, it's not marsh. I thought you were going to ask me. 
what if the, what if the, the detrimental thing? That, that's, that's, that's okay. That's that's a more serious question. If it's just Narishkite, he'll grow he'll grow out of the Narishkite. Yeah? How do you say Narishkite in Moroccan? <laughs> Just let the Moroccans don't have any Irish guy to say there's no word for it. Nonsense. <laughs> Nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, so um, if the Irish guy is bad for him, if it's not an Irish guy, it's stupidity, so he'll grow out of it. Or he won't grow out of it. Yeah? I'll give you an example of an Irish guy, which, okay, of a stupidity. A, a, a sport with a guy on the mound has his bunniness. He's looking very deeply and thinking very hard about how he's going to throw this ball. And then there's somebody standing two feet away with a piece of wood. <laughs> and there's this guy from him. He's thinking very hard. And there's the wind up. <laughs> Somebody told me that he, uh, before Shoshone is usually the World Series uh, down south. So he's more worried about what's going to happen with the Red Sox and the Yankees than what's going to happen in Rosh Hashanah. And he knows. It's, you know, so I asked him, do you remember last year when the, two panthers we used to say, the Red Sox were ahead 3 to 1, the Yankees were ahead 3 to 1, and the Red Sox won three straight games and swept the World Series. Do you remember that? He says, yes. And how did you feel? He says, it was Tishaba. It was terrible. And today, how do you feel? It's okay. So you see, it really wasn't anything. I'm not inveighing against sports. A, a kid could do a lot worse, yeah, than baseball and football and basketball, trust me, okay? Now, listen, Bach Vogel said, why is it we have such an interest in sports? Because instinctively we're drawn to conflict. Because it's a world of conflict. The human being is programmed for conflict. That's why they have two teams. And one is clearly better than the other, there's no interest. Yeah? Because there's conflict. This is what I'm listening to. So that's an Irish guy even we didn't, we didn't grow out of. Yeah? So let's not decide so fast. And maybe I hurt somebody's feelings now by making fun of baseball. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I was talking to a guy from St. Louis, the older man. I said, Stan Musial. So he said, no, oh, you're a Bucky. Okay? And he always had that, you know. I can tell you stories galore about that, but not, we have more important things to do at the time. So that's first of all. If it's that damaging, so then you have to ask the child, what do you get out of this? And you know what? What, what, are you pay, what price are you going to pay for this? You know, a kid's interested in things that are big. So I need to know why. Whenever you have a question, the beginning of that, the answer to that question is why. My Rebbe Zechariah Rebbe said in, in last week's parsha, Moshe Rabbeinu is walking past the burning bush, and that's that's pretty amazing. Bush and burning and nothing going on. It's not being consumed. See what Moshe said? He didn't say, hey man, that's amazing! That's not what he said. He said, madua. <coughs> madua lo yiva hasne. Why? If I don't know why, I have nothing from the spectacular side. So I need to know why he's interested in it. Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's hormones. Maybe it's something else. But you have to figure out why. And this is one of the reasons that people need to be protected at a young age from things that they can't resist. Things they can't resist. They, are, they see things. And like, what do you want? You, you take a kid into a candy store and you tell them, okay, you know, you can, I'll be back in an hour. You know, and the kid's hungry. And, you talk, and, and he knows that whatever he takes will be okay because he'll dad, dad will pay for it. You expect that kid not to take any any uh, any um, artificial coloring in white sugar. White sugar is a terrible thing that makes kids hyperactive. The only ones who get white sugar are my grandchildren. 
That shape, look at that. That cool little shape. Yeah, you want some white? Yes, have plenty of white sugar. <laughs> I am a total hypocrite with my grandchildren. Okay? Except for that, no one else should have hash that white sugar. Okay, look, what do you want from the kid? Yeah? So then you have to protect him. He doesn't have to be loved. The kid is too hard for him. You have to protect him. There's this book called Raising Roses Among the Thorns. I agree with most of the things that the author says over here. And uh, there's, a, there's a question here about uh, whether you should protect the kid from the environment or expose him. That is probably the heaviest question of our times. Because if you don't expose him when he needs to be exposed, you got trouble. But if you expose him too early, it's a problem. It's a problem. There's a place in near Montreal, Tush. So most of us don't raise our kids there. And if I applied to live there, they probably wouldn't let me in because I was too modern. Okay? It's a heavy question. It's not, if it's not, I go with it. And hopefully people will grow out of it. Trauma is things that are more important. If it's not an guy, then you, know, you have to see about protecting it. If it has a peanut allergy, make sure there's no peanuts in your hands. Yeah? I know it's a trivial question, but... No, it can't be. Well, you touched upon it, but it, it happens in my own house with a, a child who's uh, between 7 or 10 years old, and uh, a tiny cut that to, that to her is the, is the world, and we let her cry, but I just want to, you sort of stop there on the point, to what extent, because she could cry for 20 minutes, and at the same time, I want to say, get over it, be tougher, but I don't want to diminish her pain, but I know it can't be 20 minutes of crying. Right. As I said, we started off this talk, I guess we're going to finish it the same way, the good question means both sides of the question are right, and therefore the beginning of an answer to a good question is it depends. So it depends. Yeah? This kid has to get two messages. One is, I care about you. And the other is, like, you know, this, is, this doesn't warrant that. At your age, you should know. Yeah? That's the question. So you need to do both. Yeah? And the kid will get used to the idea that you feel with her. But then you say, but, you know, fine. Yeah? It's, if you've given the empathy and the emotion, then you have earned the right to say, okay, it's enough at a certain age. But even here also, you need to ask why. Any abnormal behavior, you need to ask why. And first you have to eliminate all physical reasons before we go into psychology. We had a boy last year, two years ago in yeshiva, the boy had used to fall asleep at, in Seder for very short amounts of time and couldn't keep cover himself. And he was very upset. So in America, they told him, it's psychological. Because if a doctor doesn't know what it is, and it can't be that he doesn't know what it is, so it must be psychological. So I said, psychological? Kids falling asleep. So we sent him uh, to Dr. Dickman, the very big neurologist in Yerushalayim, in, in a few seconds, he, he diagnosed it with narcolepsy, which is a um, which will cause uh, a, kid, a kid person to. Uh, it's not epilepsy, but it's something that you know the brain just turns off for a few seconds. And he, and we save his life because such a person can never drive because you just you don't fall asleep at the wheel, except on the way here at that traffic you can fall asleep at the wheel. Yeah? <laughs> But, um, but he gave him Ritalin. He didn't have ADD, but he gave him Ritalin. And Ritalin works for that also. So you ha if a person's depressed, blood test! Maybe they have uh, mononucleosis. The side effect of mononucleosis is depression. So you have to eliminate all the physical things first. And then you can talk about why does this kid feel the need to scream? Because maybe that's... Why do kids scream? Because the mother is multitasking, and only when the kid raises his voice uh, is the mother here. So you tell the kid, if you're a mother, to come over and touch you in order to get your attention. Okay, uh, uh, there's a nonverbal message to say, the only one. No, there's uh, our, our, I think <laughs> we can start. We should start. We thank Rabbi Orlick very, very, very much, and uh, I know you. I know, I know you.